My name is Jeffrey Weinstein, and I am a senior financial economist in the FDIC Center for Financial Research and one of the judges for the competition. I would like to introduce you to the other four judges. We have Kenneth Kelly, chairman and CEO of First Independence Bank, David Hanrahan, president of Century Savings Bank, Amanda Heights, assistant professor of finance at Tulane University and FDIC Center for Financial Research visiting scholar, and Ronnie Kissin, senior financial economist in the FDIC Center for Financial Research. And then I would also like to introduce the students who will be presenting in this session. We have Kirsten Colvin, Ian Murray Hugh, Ty McDaniel Miller, and Oliver Stordahl. And so without further ado, please go ahead and share your screen and start your presentation. Thanks. The banking industry has undergone an extraordinary amount of consolidation since the 1990s. The number of commercial banks has decreased from over 11,000 in 1992 to around 4,000 in 2020. This has resulted in benefits for both consumers and businesses due to cost decreases and improvements in services. In light of these benefits, our concern about small community banks may seem unusual. However, we will argue that this is an area of concern and the FDIC, legislators and other regulatory agencies should focus on ensuring their continued viability. In particular, we will argue that these banks perform well and provide essential services to rural and low community, low income communities. Community banks can be characterized as relatively small, often single market financial institutions with assets less than 10 billion. The FDIC's definition takes the type, percentage, and geographic scope of a bank's lending activity into account. The primary reason for consolidation in the commercial banking industry is the significant economies of scale present in banking. Since 1994, when regulations on interstate banking began to be phased out, banks have largely consolidated through mergers and acquisitions at an average annual rate of about 4%. While the total amount of mergers has slowed since the financial crisis, few new bank charters are issued and the number of banks continues to shrink. Intercompany mergers, which are mergers between two different organizations, have increased in recent years accounting for 77% of decline in bank charters from 2012 to 2019. While it is certainly true that there are advantages to size, we will argue that smaller banks have also performed well over the last decade and that the advantages of size can be achieved at a relatively small scale. Community banks have a significant comparative advantage when it comes to so-called relationship banking. The decline in community banking is a well-documented phenomenon, but its implications are less well understood. Our findings will argue that community banking is especially beneficial for rural, minority, and low-income communities. One in five counties in the U.S. is served only by a single community bank, making it an essential lifeline for mortgage, agricultural, and commercial lending. Lawmakers and regulators must consider approaches that encourage community banking, discourage consolidation, or both. One advantage of these community banks is their close ties to the communities in which they lend which makes them better suited to evaluate local loan risks than larger banks. This can allow greater access to loans for small businesses and consumers. Qualitative customer analysis allows community banks to have greater flexibility in lending than their commercial counterparts. Larger banks are more likely to make loans based solely off of the numbers, using predefined credit scores, levels of collateral, and hard and fast cutoffs that leave no room for qualitative analysis. With the focus on relationship banking and in close contact with local market conditions, community banks are better positioned to consider the wide range of factors that actually determine a loan recipient's creditworthiness. This facilitates increased lending, which in turn increases income growth and opportunities in areas that might otherwise be left behind. These banks also help to support small businesses. Despite holding only 15% of total industry loans in 2019, community banks held 36% of all small business loans. A number of these studies by the Fed and other institutions have found that when community, a community bank is acquired by a large institution, small business lending by that bank undergoes a considerable decrease. Additionally, small business reports greater satisfaction with smaller banks. Most recently, we note that they have also taken a very important role in originating loans for the Paytech Protection Program. In the first round, community banks made 31% of PPP loans relative to their 15% share of total loans, a disproportionately high contribution. Community banks are also the primary agricultural lenders, holding 70% of all agricultural loans in the United States, 
they are central to rural America. The Department of Agriculture classifies a quarter of rural counties as agriculture dependent. These banks may also serve small depositors better. Local retail deposits are more important to most community banks than larger banks. Community banks hold a significant share of market deposits under $100,000. As these relatively small depositors account for a larger share of their business, these banks can devote more time to and better serve less wealthy depositors. In addition, they generally charge lower fees for their services. Rural and low-income communities have challenges that other areas may not face. First, internet access is still limited in many parts of the country. Second, rural areas tend to have lower incomes and levels of education, as well as populations that are relatively older. Thus, the availability of online banking services is less useful for these areas, and the importance of physical banking offices where consumers and businesses can obtain help in person cannot be understated. The same is also true for low-income and minority communities in less rural areas, where language barriers may be an additional problem. For these reasons, we argue that community banks have real effects on the areas that they serve, even though they are often unquantifiable or difficult to measure. However, there are also many measurable parts of bank performance, as Oliver will now discuss. Our sample period stretched from the first quarter of 2012 to the fourth quarter of 2019. Many existing studies used earlier periods and thus are less timely, and excluding the financial crisis and the pandemic period, dropped outlier values that would skew results. Ty argued that community banks are better able to evaluate creditworthiness and net charge-off rates back this up. The net charge-off rate for these banks is less than half that of commercial banks. Small banks must be more careful in choosing loan recipients and more intentional about working with borrowers, in part because the consequences of a given loan loss are greater for a smaller bank. We also found that community banks hold a higher percentage of deposits relative to total assets, as well as a higher percentage of long-term total assets, indicating that a larger percentage of their business is derived from traditional loan activity, such as long-term mortgage or agricultural lending. During our sample period, the the return on assets of non-community banks is 12 basis points higher, although considerably more variable. The difference in means is not statistically significant but the difference in variances is highly significant. During most of our sample period, the ROA of community banks exhibited a clear upward trend. We then considered return on equity. The average ROE of non-community banks was higher, but not significantly so. The variability was both higher and significant. We also found that the quarterly average yield on earning assets, as well as the net interest margin, were actually higher for community banks as well. Based on these measures, we conclude that while non-community banks may earn a slightly higher average return, the variability of these returns is significantly greater. Community banks are not, in general, failing institutions that require assistance to survive, but there are differences in performance between community banks. Thus, the best performing community banks may be targets for merger and acquisition, further consolidating the industry, while the worst performing which are likely also to be located in rural and low income areas are less likely to survive in the long run. Finally, we consider costs. Community banks do have a higher efficiency ratio, non-interest expense divided by revenue than others and higher scores imply less efficiency. Community banks are, at least by this measure, less efficient, their major weakness. While many factors contribute to this, we know first, that smaller banks are less able to take advantage of economies of scale in many areas, and second, smaller banks bear a significantly heavier burden in terms of regulatory compliance costs, as Ian discusses in the next section. However, we also wish wish to note the 2020 FDIC study by Jesuits, Kravitz, and Shukri on economies of scale and community banking. The authors find that while the minimum efficient scale of banks has continued to increase over time, 90% of cost efficiencies are achieved by the time a bank's loan portfolio reaches 300 million. Thus, small banks can reach an efficient scale without becoming giants. Community banks do face a lower quantity and stringency of imposed regulations than their larger counterparts. Larger banks are, by virtue of the volume and diversity of their revenue generating activities, able to accommodate these fixed costs with greater ease than small, local lending oriented community banks. Larger banks are typically involved in other lines of business, like investment banking and wealth management, 
which have lower efficiency ratios due to a lighter regulatory burden. Uniform statements about compliance costs are difficult to make for the banking industry as a whole, and this is no less true when considering only community banks. One community bank might have 30 branches and assets approaching a billion dollars, while another might have five branches and assets below 50 million. Regulatory compliance costs, both implicit and explicit, are going to be worlds apart for these two banks, even though they belong to the same nominal category of the banking sector. Making uniform statements about compliance costs is further complicated by the fact that when drafting and implementing legislation, regulators do not use the term community bank. This omission is consistent with the variation we find among the banks that fall in this category. There are now innumerable rules and regulations, many of which have sliding thresholds at which they take effect. It is therefore difficult to say that X rule or Y regulation applies or does not apply to community banks. A 2013 case study conducted by the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau examined the regulatory burden in terms of explicit compliance costs at seven banks of various sizes. The CFPB found that two banks included in the study, both of which had below a billion dollars in assets, faced compliance costs of 3.9% and 5.6% of retail deposit operating expenses, respectively. To put these numbers in perspective, this is more than double the percentage paid by banks with assets over a billion dollars. Percentage-wise, smaller banks face much higher compliance costs. The overarching goal of post-financial crisis banking regulation was the shoring up of the financial system in order to prevent a repeat scenario. The Dodd-Frank Act is the most comprehensive piece of banking legislation to date. At 848 single-spaced pages, it is longer than all of its predecessors combined. If small banks, which had little to do with the financial crisis, are placed under a heavier burden by these regulations than the large, systemically important institutions they are meant to target, then the regulations need to be reconsidered. While clearly we are concerned about banks that are too big to fail, we must also be aware that regulation can make some banks too small to succeed. Our findings call for action. Although not all these ideas can be implemented by the FDIC, we propose the following measures as steps toward remedying this problem. First, improve the distribution of the regulatory burden. The current regulatory system acts as a regressive tax. The more assets a bank, a bank has, and thus the more impact it might have in a financial crisis, the lower its regulatory burden is relative to its overall size of operations. Second, waive or reduce fees paid by community banks to regulatory agencies. These agencies receive the vast majority of their income from the largest banks, thus reducing Reducing fees for community banks would help lessen the regulatory burden without significantly affecting agency funding. Third, the FDIC, which must approve bank mergers, might consider objecting to any mergers that significantly reduce community banking, particularly in rural areas. Fourth, help to level the playing field for rural community banks. Two major competitors are credit unions and farm credit. Credit unions have tax-exempt status, which is appropriate when credit unions are small. However, the largest credit unions now approach or exceed $100 billion in assets and should therefore be treated like any other 12-figure financial institution. Likewise, the farm credit system, which is able to borrow at very low rates in part due to government sponsorship, has an unfair advantage, especially since the system has been criticized for giving nearly half of its loans to a relatively small number of large agribusiness borrowers. Fifth. Create tax credits for community banks that lend to low-income and minority individuals, businesses, and farmers. Tax credits could also be offered to encourage community banks to develop financial literacy programs, which are greatly needed. And finally, provide programs and partnerships with fintech firms to facilitate the adoption of new financial technologies by community banks. The FDIC's 2020 Community Banking Study found that adoption of new fintech led to higher bank assets. There was also large, a large difference in asset growth between low and high adopting banks. These programs we are proposing should be focused specifically on smaller community banks, as bank size and resources influence the adoption of financial technologies. Communities, both rural and low-income urban, have a demonstrated need for banking access that is consistent with and responsive to their needs. Community banks are uniquely positioned to provide additional benefits to these areas, including the promotion of financial literacy and the provision of loans to disadvantaged groups. We reiterate the viability, the demonstrated profitability, and the undeniable importance of community banks at the current time. The FDIC's mission is to maintain stability and confidence in the financial system, 
We believe that mission is served in part by continued support of community banking. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Let's go ahead and start the um, Q&A session. I'm sorry. Uh, very good job. This is Kenneth Kelly from First Independence based in Detroit. I, I will tell you very thorough in what you put together. The question I have for you is, as you think about community banks and the proposals that you just stated, how do we get the support to ensure that those proposals become effectuated? So as things stand right now, uh, the FDIC and the OCC get most of their operating uh, money, operating revenue from the fees imposed on the larger banks. I believe it's the largest four banks they get most of their money from. So we would propose perhaps increasing to a nominal degree the fees imposed on these larger banks and eliminating, if not decreasing significantly, the fees imposed on the smaller banks. Yeah, we think that this would be able, especially that um, proposal would gain support because uh, for banks under $1 billion, that only represents about 2% of the agency's total income. So chances are they're more willing to waive or reduce the fees for community banks, which would help them in their profitability. Um, I'm Amanda Heights. I'm, I'm an assistant professor at Tulane. And the question that I have for you is there's a lot of fixed costs associated with compliance. So it's not necessarily the case that you can think of just cutting costs for banks because what those costs of com comprise of are a very substantial fixed cost as well as a variable cost. How do you think that your subsidy could address this 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 large fixed cost, which is really the bulk of the compliance burden? So the majority of the compliance costs for smaller banks actually comes from, uh, I believe it's consulting, because there's a lot to wade through. I, I don't have to tell you guys, you you know that these are very thick, um, very thick papers that that contain the regulations. Um, so although we didn't include it in our presentation. Um, over the course of, you know, the next few decades or something, uh, there could perhaps be some, I, I guess, simplification of these, uh, these regulations. Does somebody else want to, want to, want to give it a go? It's a hard question. It's, this one's tough. Ooh. So maybe to give you a little bit, um, something to think about is that if these small community banks do face this very high fixed cost associated with this regulatory burden, um, one way to kind of help them might be to subsidize it, where even though if they just, you know, one potential way, or even if they need to, to, to hire the people, this could be a way to, to, to ease that burden on them. I think that this is something consistent with, with, the, with the message that you're saying. I didn't mean to scare you guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm mm. usually quite nice. <laughs> no, uh, absolutely. Uh, software and technology is another significant portion of uh, compliance costs for these banks because, you know, the software costs what it costs, right, regardless of maybe the size of the bank. Um, and so perhaps a subsidy for the implementation of these, uh, I guess, software programs would be beneficial to these smaller banks. Well stated. Thank you. Thank you. I really like the presentation. Uh, it was really good. Uh, just on your on your proposals. So you call for leveling the playing field and um, removing the implicit and explicit subsidies that, say, credit unions get, right? To to uh, remove kind of the thumb from the scale and help the community banks. But then you talk about creating tax credits for community banks, right? So. You're removing one piece of regulation that that uh, tilts the uh, playing field toward uh, you know, away from the community banks, and then uh, and then you're trying to uh, create the same regulation, a similar regulation that would help the community banks. Are you worried um, about potential distortions that this would introduce to to the picture? Right. It, my feeling is that maybe these two proposals kind of negate each other to some extent. So yeah. I, want to, I want you guys to expand on this a little bit. I think overall we want to level the playing field between the two or the three. So 
it would kind of be an either or situation. So if you weren't going to take away those subsidies from farm credit and credit unions, then you need to help boost up community banks with creating tax credits for them. Yes, these proposals that we had, um, we recognize that, of course, not all of them can be implemented. Altogether, they may not work. Um, they might, they may not have synergy, as you were pointing out, but alone, um, we could pick one or the other. My worry is more that, you know, the second proposal is a bit counterproductive given your analysis, right? So your analysis said that, well, we created an unlevel playing field, uh, which harms the community banks. So let's remove that distortion by removing the subsidy that we give uh, their competitors. And instead of just removing the subsidy and stopping there, you then call um, to create an additional subsidy, an additional tax support for community banks, which is kind of the you know, the support that you just removed from their competitors. That's the part where um, I wanted to uh, to get a bit more clarification on whether you see that there's some uh, conflict there uh, in how you view the regulation. So full disclosure, I don't know a whole lot about how um, uh, credit unions are regulated. However, uh, we're we're mostly looking at how the regulations imposed on community banks compared to those imposed on maybe the larger banks and community banks, the smaller community banks under 500 million face compliance costs almost like double that of uh, larger banks. And so I, I guess our proposal is that, okay, we want these regulations because we want the consumer to be safe. Um, but we also want these banks to be able to uh, I guess, fulfill their duty as, you know, financial intermediaries. And if a significant portion of their, you know, of depositors funds are being siphoned off into these um, uh, regulatory compliance costs, then, you know, that's good. We want the banks to be safe. We want the consumers to feel safe putting their money in the banks, but um, it, it may make sense to offset some of that with these tax credits. Do you feel there would be enough to remove the subsidies that the competitors get? To, to prop up the uh, community banking system? We left without, it. You know, without adding additional support to the community banks that you just removed from their competitors. Yes, I, I, uh, I think that absolutely would be enough. We found that in our studies, um, community banks can and do compete with commercial banks. Um, many of them are successful. Community banks aren't failing in uh, failing institutions. Um, so if the playing field was level, I think we would see a lot of growth. Thanks. Also, we left our presentation open-ended enough where we didn't suggest the size of sub subsidies. So we believe that they can be toggled as we introduce them to make sure that we don't over-level the field, if, for lack of a better term. Gotcha. Thanks. Great. So these are all, you know, very tough questions, right? How do you have regulation without without it being burdensome, right? And so this is this is really the question that 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 all of this gets down to is that regulation is necessary for the banking sector because we don't want it to fail, right? And regulation doesn't necessarily scale. There are some fixed costs associated with it. So how do we how do we make everything fair? Um, and I think that a lot of your um, your suggestions are trying are coming out with novel ways how to try to level the playing playing field, as you said. And I applaud your efforts in in trying to do that. Quite honestly, if if there was an easy solution, we probably would have already done it, right? So it's not that we're trying to 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 poke holes in the wonderful work that you've done. It's just this question is inherently difficult. And if it wasn't, it wouldn't have, it would have been solved by now. I mean, I have a question for you. Tell me a little bit about your teamwork to pull this presentation together. And that's an open-ended question. We all took responsibility to really, truly specialize in, in certain areas of our presentation. And then we each talked about those areas individually. But then together as a team, we came together and made questions for others spe about our specialized areas so that we can all understand better like how to answer questions regardless if it was our area or not so that we we specialize and then taught the others what we learned okay great thank you i'm Practice. glad you include some data about pp the paycheck protection program in your presentation you had to go to some pretty fresh sources to get that since it just occurred last year you pointed out how community banks punched above their weight uh, 
Why do you think that is? One might say that it's not in the wheelhouse of community banks to quickly stand up a lot of technology to run a program like that. Why do you think it might be that community banks did such a good job compared to their larger bank competitors with that? Well, I think it comes, um, community banks are very good at small business loans and CRE loans as well. Um, that's two of their specialties, it seems like, from the data. So I think the PPP program just kind of carried off from that. Also, these community banks have longer relations with their customers relative to the larger commercial banks. These stronger relations gave them the access for these people to reach out more easily to their community banks. Can you clarify that statement? Who has the longer relationship and how did you come to that conclusion? We found that community banks, uh, uh, because of their nature of how they, of the types of loans they give, they have longer relations with their customers, whether it be small businesses or agriculture. And uh, we believe that because of that stronger and longer relationship, that's why they were more uh, capable of reaching out to their customers. And these banks also, unlike the larger banks, take into account qualitative things. And in a you know really difficult recession like this, a lot of people's you know numbers might not be looking great. They might not be looking credit worthy, but in reality they are credit worthy. And these smaller banks, these community banks who have these relationships with the communities in which they lend, they're able to make those loans and get them get the money to where it can be profitable, to where it's to where it's needed. Whereas a larger bank, because of these hard and fast cutoffs, they're not they're not able to do that. I was just I was just had one more question about the regulation. So if you know you listed a few possible um, types of regulation or any regulation, et cetera, if there was sort of one thing on your list you would choose is if someone said you can only do one thing, you know, what what would you probably put first or would should you be considering first? And there's no wrong right or wrong answer, I think. I would um, probably choose the last one of providing par- programs and partnerships with fintech firms, especially with COVID-19. People might be shifting to online banking and not want to be face to face. So the subsidies from the FDIC or whoever would be very helpful for community banks. OK, that is time. Uh, thank you very much to our to our student team for this this fine presentation and to our judges for the Q and A. Uh, if the judges have any uh, if the judges have any final thoughts they want to they want to offer, I'll, I'll turn it over to uh, to them. Thanks, guys. You've done an excellent job. Thank Good you. Job. Thank you all. This was a privilege.